Welcome to Spring into ETF Investing. On today's special episode, our panel of guest speakers will be discussing a place to park cash, ETFs versus GICs. Welcome to Spring into ETF Investing, a special edition of ETF Market Insights. I'm Erin Allen, VP of Online Distribution with BMO ETFs. A quick reminder, today we're not providing you investment advice or recommendations. Our channel is all about providing education around investing and around ETFs focused on the Canadian do-it-yourself investor. I'm going to turn it over to our special guest host for today's session, Pat Boland. Pat is the host of the Just Word podcast, which covers topics within finance, investing, and much more. He's also a television personality and expert host. Happy to have you, Pat. Take it away. Welcome to ETF Market Insights, I'm Pat Ballin. In this episode, we'll be discussing the recent shift to cash by investors. Why are they doing this? And what should investors consider when looking to add to a cash position in their portfolio? What are their options? GICs, HISSAs, ETFs. And I'm joined by Matt Montemuro. He's the Director, Portfolio Manager with BMO ETFs, responsible for fixed income ETFs. And Jonathan Chevro a veteran financial journalist who has worked for the National Post and the Globe and Mail. He's also CFO of the Findependence Hub, a go-to source of information for education for Canadian investors. Thanks very much, gentlemen, for joining me. Uh, let's start with you, Matt, first, because why have investors moved to cash so much or cash-like alternatives, and then how much has actually moved? So 2022 was a challenging year for all asset classes. It was only the third time in 150 years that we saw both stocks and bonds have negative calendar year returns. So to avoid that volatility, we saw a lot of investors move to the sidelines, take their money out of the market, and try to wait until some of the risks subsided. And at the same time, you know, we saw the Bank of Canada raise rates from 25 basis points to 450 basis points in a single year. So not only were they taking risk out of the market, they were getting paid to do so. And we've seen as, as we moved into 2023, we've seen investors say, you know what, I'm getting paid to sit in cash, take very little to no risk, and I'm getting paid 4 to 5% yield for it. So, you know, that migration has continued. In terms of how much have we seen, you know, those ETFs now amass 20 billion in size. That's 10x growth that we've seen over the last two or three years. April alone brought in 4 billion of, of short-term and money market uh, ETF flows. So it's definitely a trade that we're seeing uh, investors continue to take advantage of, look at the yield curve and say, you know, 5% for very little risk, it's a winning trade in a lot of cases. Okay. So, Jonathan, what are the different places you can park cash? Well, I mean, looking at two years ago, it was cash is trash, if you remember. Mm -hmm. And uh, what was the other thing? Tina. There was no alternative stocks, which is pretty stressful if, like myself, and a lot of the people who read what I write about, because I write a retired money column, uh, retirees are pretty frustrated having to take risks that they didn't really want to take. And, and now, as Matt points out, if you can get 4 or 5%, where you, you basically got zero on a bank account until about 18 months ago. Uh, now, of course, the GI, GIC is back. In, in America, they call it the CD or Certificate of Deposit. In Canada, the Guaranteed Investment Certificate um, pays, last I checked, about 4.5%. It'll vary by about 50 basis points, depending on whether you're going one or five years. It's not a big, huge difference right now. Uh, in fact, the, the yield curve is inverted. So uh, in the old days, the five-year GIC would pay better. You'd be paid for locking your money away for five years uh, relative to a one-year. Right now, it's inverted. So in a one-year GIC pays better. So that's one place, I think. And we'll, maybe we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, the second one, are, are somebody you mentioned already, the HISA or High Interest Savings Account mm. or Money Market ETFs. These are, unlike GICs, you can um, basically park them day by day. And if you need the money, ideally for an emergency, or you, you, you want to buy a house, you, you take advantage of the first home savings account, for example, and buy your, get a down payment, you don't know whether you're going to find a property in six months, a year, or tomorrow, in which case a, a HISA paying three, two and a half, three percent, Matt can tell me the exact amount, uh, would be a, a valuable uh, alternative. And then thirdly, there's uh, short-term bond uh, ETFs or bond ETFs, not necessarily short-term. 
uh, until all the, in the last couple of years when people thought rates were going to start going higher, people kind of gravitated to the short term and shorter term bond ETFs. Uh, to prevent the um, the duration problems that actually did materialize. Why do we have a big problem right now with all these U.S. banks and regionals? They lost a lot of money um, on, on long-term uh, bonds. Mm. Okay, so let's break it down a little bit, Matt. Uh, the difference between HISAs, ETFs, short-term, I guess, money market ETFs as well. So the big difference is, is it, it's fundamental in what you are investing in. So let's start with the HISA ETFs. You know, you are literally investing... Or, or depositing in a uh, portfolio of high interest savings accounts. So these accounts are offered by many different banks and they generally offer a higher uh, than normal yield to incentivize deposits. So these ETFs will gather the, a portfolio of these and pass and flow through that yield to investors. Looking at short-term fixed income or money market, you're looking at a more traditional bond-like portfolio. So you know, you're investing in securities like Canadian T-bills, uh, provincial T-bills, short-term corporate bonds, federal bonds, uh, bankers' acceptance notes, commercial paper. So this is a more traditional fixed income portfolio where a borrower will look to pay a certain yield and the investor will achieve that yield in a very short time period, so very little duration risk. Both products offer a very similar yield, but fundamentally what they actually invest in or what they have in the funds is fundamentally different. So Jonathan, what should you consider before you make a decision on the route that you take? Well, number one is what do you need the money for and when do you need it? So if you, uh, most people need an emergency fund, so the rule of thumb has been you should have six months of your salary tucked away in case you lose your job and your boss gets annoyed at you. You can uh, keep the, the, the lights on and you, the, the water bills and all the rest of it paid uh, until you find a new job. Uh, on the, the other extreme, you're saving for retirement. You have a 30-year time horizon. You probably don't want to be in a money market fund because if the rate right now the rate of inflation is higher than uh, what you're getting on, even, even though 4.5% sounds pretty good, if you're if it's six percent inflation, which we've been up to close to, then you're actually losing relative to inflation. Mm. Uh, so then liquidity liquidity is is to me a, a big concern. There's not that much difference right now in in the yield between, um, for example, the five year GIC and a one year GIC. In fact, because the yield curve is inverted, the one year GIC actually pays better than a five year GIC. So you might say, well, then why would I want to lock my money up and not have access to it? For five years? Well, the reason is we're not sure that interest rates are going to keep on going higher. Maybe they've just sort of stabilized. And in, in fact, what if they came down again? Then your retiree that's so happy about having 5% uh, on, on a, a risk free investment may say, gee, I shouldn't have put it in that one year GIC for just 25 basis extra. Uh, I should have, uh, I should have um, kept it kept my powder dry, and or I should have done the opposite. I should have extended out to five years. So that now that interest rates have come down again, like what if you're back into uh, ZERP, zero interest rate policy again by the, the central banks, then you'll wish you had gone to the five-year GIC. Yeah, it's a cash 22. You touched on liquidity. And so Matt, uh, why use an ETF? So, you know, we've seen that migration into a lot of ETFs, and I think it's, it's that intraday liquidity, that flexibility that it gives investors. You know, it allows you, uh, like Jonathan said, you know, you don't have to time the market. You don't have to expect, oh, I'm going to buy a house in six months from now, or I'm going to buy a house in a year from now. And, and you can avoid all those lockup periods that, that kind of plague the GIC investment and, and kind of worry investors. So, you know, that flexibility of the ETF allowing you intraday liquidity, allowing you to pivot and redeploy your cash, whether you need to spend it on a big expenditure or redeploy it into the equity market because maybe there's an opportunity that you see and you want to uh, take it, move it from cash back into equ equities on a risk on like trade. So, you know, the ETF provides uh, flexibility for investors, transparency. You can see it trading on the exchange. You know, uh, you have transparency in terms of price and it gives you a lot of different options. You have CAD options, USD. You have the type. We just talked about HISA versus money market. You have a lot of options that give you the exact exposure you may need for that cash allocation, and, you, and it's very transparent and, and predictable. Every investment, though, has some degree of risk. Not very much in cash or cash-like alternatives, Jonathan, but what are some of the considerations of risk? Well, 
I mean, I, I personally, I like the asset allocation ETFs, you know, they, which basically take away all the problem. As Matt said in his introduction, like 2022 was an unusual year that even balanced funds, including balanced ETFs, were down. Uh, I, don't, I haven't looked at the figures lately, but I would think that the, ironically, the more conservative balanced ETFs, and if you had the ones with, which were 80% fixed income, and the investor was thinking that that was going to be the most risk-free uh, they'd actually get the rude awakening that they lost more because of the bonds were down. That uh, if you if you look at your portfolio, you're going, oh, I was saved. Uh, I was saved because you know gold was up or certain uh, equity sectors were up, and the the stocks ironically were hit less than the bond portion of the portfolio. Um, but I think over the long run, uh, the classic pension fund portfolio of 60-40, 60% stocks, 40% bonds, uh, whether that's a pension fund or an asset allocation ETF, or even a balanced mutual fund, they should hold uh, investors uh, pretty, pretty safe in the long run. In light of what Jonathan just uh, said then, Matt, um, what do you have to consider when you're looking at these cash alternatives as far as risk is concerned and, and throw in tax as well? Absolutely. So let, let's start with the, the risk side of, of the coin. Um, you know, you're looking at lockup periods. That's something to consider. You know, you don't want to lock away your capital for too long. And if you do, you know, if the market changes, if opportunities come, that if, if your money is locked up, you're, you may not be able to take advantage of those opportunities. So that's something to consider when looking at a GIC that may have a longer than a, you know, uh, six month, 12 month, 18 month lockup period, that's something to consider. The second is, you know, although cash pays four to five percent, Jonathan mentioned before that inflation at, you know, we're at four percent now, but it was six percent earlier this year. You need to make sure that your uh, what you're earning is, is keeping up with inflation. So that real rate of return. And so that's something to consider in a high interest rate, uh, high inflation environment. We haven't seen that in quite some time. So that's something, uh, one of the other considerations. Um, and then from a tax perspective, you know, tax is unique. On fixed income, if you're a taxable investor, it's important to be tax aware. Um, you know, the distribution yield or the coupon is what you get taxed at, at, at as income. So for a HISA or a GIC, that top line yield, that 5% yield, let's call it, gets taxed as income. You know, short-term fixed income, you also get that distribution yield, but there's a unique anomaly in the market right now. Because last year had such a challenging year for returns, most fixed income, most bonds are trading at a discount to par, meaning that their price is lower than $100. So what that means is that distribution yield, that coupon tends to be lower. So let's call it 3% and the yield to maturity is 5%. So you're getting taxed as income on the three and you get a capital gain to the five. And on after tax basis, you could add 50 to 100 basis points to your return by just making that consideration and looking into that decision uh, when, when looking to invest your cash. So you know it's important for, for taxable investors to be tax aware and to just to understand how your investments are going to be taxed at the end of the year. Okay, Jonathan, so how should people actually use these cash alternatives in constructing their portfolios? Well, we discussed uh, the cash portion of the asset allocation ETS last time. Um, personally, I think that the inflation bonds is an interesting topic. People say, well, gee, what happened to uh, real return bonds? Well, the Canadian government actually has suspended that program, but the pension funds in Canada are, are quite annoyed because it was a perfect way to match their liabilities for long-term pensioners. Uh, fortunately, you can buy tips in the States. They still have them. They're called Treasury, Infl Treasury Inflation Protected Securities. And in fact, BMO has... Uh, What's the name of that fund? Two, two different ETFs, ZTIP and TIPS. So which, which, which I owned. So uh, that seems like the best of all worlds. Uh, I would hope that somebody would be lobbying the government of Canada to reintroduce re-overturn bonds because you've got to hedge the, those ones because they're in U.S. dollars. And you have, you're, 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 you're fixing one risk at the expense of another one. You're introducing some currency risk. So yes, the BMO tips product is kind of gets around that by hedging back in the Canadian dollar. And as I think, as you said, there's also a U.S. dollar version. Correct. Hmm. Okay. So all of this is against the background of the environment, the fixed income environment. Matt, just summarize what's going on right now. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, 2022, 
tough year all around, but I think there's a lot of opportunity in fixed income as we move forward in 2023. You know, the Bank of Canada has set to pause their interest rate hiking policy. So we're likely at a peak in rates in Canada at about 4.5% overnight rate. The Fed this week just raised by another 25 basis points. They haven't explicitly said that they're, they are pausing, but the market firmly expects that, you know, hike in May and go away. And we expect that to be the pause. So what I see going forward is I think we're going to get stability in our interest rate policy right now. We're going to likely hit a peak in interest rates. Um, but as I look forward, I'm the view we're going to be in a higher rate for longer. And the reason I, I say we're going to see higher rates for longer is that I think the uh, it takes a lot of time for interest rate hikes to make their way through the system, 18 to 24 months. And I think we've made meaningful progress in reducing inflation from 6 to 4%. But I think that 4 to 2% to get to the Bank of Canada's target, that's going to be the stubborn, sticky inflation that's going to take the 18 to 24 months to really start to make a dent. So, you know, although I think some pundits are saying that we're going to see cuts this year, I think we're going to be in a higher interest rate environment for longer. Uh, I think we're going to get stability. So I think there is opportunity in the bond market. I think looking at, like we were talking about, these cash ETFs that are yielding 5% in the short end, you know, that's a perfect example of investors being able to take advantage of the market and say, okay, I can take very little interest rate risk little interest, uh, interest rate sensitivity risk in, by way of duration and still achieve a 5% yield. That's very attractive. That's something we haven't seen since the mid 2000s. So, you know, I think investors need to consider the market right now. I think be happy that we're entering a more stable environment, but also expect we're not going to necessarily go back down to zero, you know, just at the end of this year. So I think that's something to for investors to to tackle with. I think we are in a very positive environment for bonds. So you know, if I was looking forward, I think uh, bond investors should be very happy with returns this year. You know, and I think I favor the short end of the curve in terms of uh, credit exposure, and then complementing that with some uh, long duration exposure. Because if we do expect higher rates for longer, we're likely going to see an economic slow down, an equity market pullback, and that long duration exposure will help be the ballast of your portfolio at the end of the day. Matt, Jonathan, thank you so much for your insights. Thanks, Pat. And I hope this gives investors some ideas around what they should be considering when evaluating the different cash options that are out there and why it's important to maintain diversification in your portfolio. I want to thank BMO ETS for continuing these educational segments for investors, helping them become better and more informed. Have a great day.